this panel um, will talk more about it. I'm very happy to have um, Huda Gossi from Tunisia with us as the moderator for this session. Huda has been involved in several years in WSA, have been part of our jury. Over to you, Huda, and have a fantastic panel. Thank you. Okay, unfortunately, uh, Huda had some technical problems. Um, so I have the pleasure to announce the official opening of the session by the Executive Sec Secretary of UN Esquire, Ms. Rola Dashti, and I hope I pronounced your name right. Please have your opening remarks with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nora. Good morning, everybody, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to open the Arab region Connect for Impact in this special virtual edition of the World Summit Award Global Congress 2021. The WSA board and working teams have certainly succeeded in converting the restrictive lockdown measures worldwide into an opportunity to virtually engage all countries in this special Congress. Digital content, as you are all aware, and its applications are the foundation of the knowledge society and are much needed to support digital transformation, build forward better, and sustain development efforts to achieve the 2030 Agenda. The COVID-19 pandemic had demonstrated the urgent need for digital technologies and processes on, in all countries to enhance their resilience to crisis and support the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. Today, innovative applications and platforms are crucial for sustaining public and private services and facilitating daily interaction and communication. Creative mechanisms providing vital services are essential to all people, including vulnerable groups in both urban and rural areas, especially during lockdown. The pandemic and its associated crisis have highlighted the importance of digital technologies to the continuity of daily activities. For over 15 years, ESQA has worked toward developing the information society in the Arab region and was a pioneer in instigating digital Arab content to create economic opportunities and preserve the Arabic language and culture online. Providing content in Arabic is necessary to reach populations who do not speak other languages to ensure inclusiveness. Online content on Arabic cultures must also be available to non-Arab speakers worldwide. The responsibility of developing digital Arabic content lies with all decision makers in government, university, the private sector, NGOs, and with individuals and entrepreneurs who are designing and developing digital products and services. In this context, I urge young innovators to take part in preserving the Arab identity online and to create digital products for the knowledge economy in the Arab region. Digital Arab content remains weak compared with other languages at less than 1% of total global content. ASCO and the International Chamber of Commerce have launched a Center for Entrepreneurship to inspire entrepreneurship innovation and improve the business environment for SMEs in the Arab region. The center is based in Beirut and will work with various stakeholders to digitize SMEs, connect local entrepreneurs to global markets, and enhance regulatory conditions for SMEs to strive. From developing the skills of young people to mentoring, monitoring uh, local start startups and entrepreneurs, the center is devoted to improving the livelihood of citizens in Lebanon and the Arab region. ASCO will also launch an interactive platform to support innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship in the Arab region. I'm also pleased to announce a partnership between ASCO and WSA on the, on the Digital Arab Content Award, which will, be, which will bring about innovative digital solutions and content for the Arab region in support of the SDGs. The first cycle of this award will be launched in a few days at the Arab Forum for Sustainable Development in Beirut. The ASQA team is looking forward to a fruitful collaboration 
with WSA and all of you on this award. I wish all, you all a successful and vibrant event. Thank you very much for my invitation. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are very happy to work with um, Esqua in order to make this Arab Digital Content Award available for sustainable development and to be with you at the Global Forum. I am now very, very happy to um, introduce the moderator for this session coming from us to Tunisia, uh, from Tunisia, Huda Gossi. Huda, over to you. Good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rola, for this uh, introduction. Um, I am also happy now to uh, show how entrepreneurs are the ones who are also instrumental in helping this uh, industry to thrive. So Zuhair Lakhdisi, CEO of Dial uh, Technology from Morocco. Uh, I know that you have been the lucky winner of this edition in 2014. How about you tell us more on how this happened and what impact this had on your own adventure? Thank you very much, um, Huda, for your introduction. Thank you, Nora, for the invitation. And it's really a pleasure to be with you today. I am the only man in this prestigious and uh, I'm really honored to be uh, to be uh, here with this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, very talented and prestigious women that's working on the digital era. Uh, my belief before talking about the company is that uh, the future of digital and the future of technology, the future of jobs are women. Uh, if the first industrial revolution uh, was responsible to um, uh, replace the manual and physical work, which balanced the workplace between men and women. The fourth industrial revolution, which, which will be led by in artificial intelligence, will be more interesting because it will help uh, or it will push uh, the, the workplace to be more concentrated on emotional intelligence, on social intelligence and on human intelligence. And there that's where women, I think, are really key in the next uh, uh, the next years in terms of technology. So just to go back to the company, so we uh, won the, the World Summit Award on 2014 uh, with a, a, a project called Sehatuk, uh, which was a kind of, uh, it's a mobile app that helps people in uh, different countries, in Morocco, but also it's it, it worked in, in other countries. Uh, to access or to be accompanied by a kind of digital companion that helps them find the best doctors, the best medicines, the be uh, to uh, identify, for example, what kind of, uh, of sickness they can, uh, they can have uh, and so on. So basically, the, this was our first attempt to uh, work on the health tech uh, arena. And uh, we really find it very interesting um, so uh, after that, we developed a lot of uh, healthcare solutions. And in the last COVID, uh, in, in the last year during COVID, we've been um, uh, working on a lot of projects regarding the health sector and helping people uh, regarding this pandemic. Uh, we uh, launched a, a chatbot uh, for COVID uh, using Arabic, um, uh, local dialects, and also um, English. We also helped with the COVID tracking uh, service that was launched by the government. And uh, we're also able to participate in different innovation pro projects, like, for example, an intelligence mask that was developed by one of uh, the companies I, I worked with. So uh, basically, uh, what we learned from this winning, what we learned from this wonderful WSA community are three things. First, that's we need to do a business with purpose. Uh, second, that we need to develop technology with impact. And third, that we need to be as much as possible diverse and international. And uh, thanks, thanks to uh, this, um, this WSA uh, winning, we've been able to work a lot on these fields to develop internationally uh, and to be as diverse as possible. Just to give you an example of diversity that we try to put in the company, um, now we have 70% of the engineer engineers teams who are women. Uh, we have five different nationalities in the team uh, and we try to have as much as possible 
diverse perspective inside the company in order to develop more on international uh, arena. Uh, I want to finish by saying two things. Uh, I think this uh, pandemic that we lived and we're still living uh, till today uh, is something that remind us, reminded us of uh, how important technology, uh, R&D and digital are important in terms of the economic model we're developing, how health and education are important in terms of the social model that we need to develop, and how values like trust, collaboration, solidarity, and creation of value are important in the, in the, in the value model that we need to develop in our countries. And I will finish by saying that in this uh, era where um, artificial intelligence is dominating, uh, we need to uh, be extremely more intelligent, um, uh, strongly less artificial, and profoundly more uh, human in order to develop our countries, the earth, and uh, all our uh, uh, all human beings. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak about this, and I will be pleased to join you in the panel later on. Thank you so much, Zuhair. This was uh, very inspiring. Um, and uh, talking about diversity, I am very happy to introduce this panel. Uh, in, including really eminent uh, women uh, and also, of course, Zuhair, so including Manar, Batul and Rania. So maybe just to start so that the audience get to know you more, I'm going to ask you to do a, a quick round table, just introducing your backgrounds and your activities, uh, and then we will move on with the questions. So um, very quickly here, Manar, um, maybe you would like to, to start and uh, present yourself. Um, well, it's my pleasure to be in this panel for sure, and I was really happy to hear uh, what Zuhair had said by having uh, their staff up to 70% women, uh, and that for me reflects uh, the majority of women working in the field of uh, IT. I hope they are uh, working in the technical side uh, of the company more and more um, as I have seen over the years that there are more women graduating from computer engineering, computer studies uh, than men uh, for some reason. I think it does have to do with, uh, with the amount of patience and the focus that women are willing uh, to take so seriously. Uh, well, having said that, I'm a computer engineer myself. Uh, I have been um, uh, an entrepreneur uh, for 21 years now. Uh, I have been working on uh, advocacy to raise the awareness of the importance of e-content, digital content uh, since 21 years ago. Uh, of course, I have seen the changes, uh, I have seen the challenges, uh, and I have seen lots of success stories as well that I would love to share with you. Thank you so much, Manar. Uh, uh, Batul, uh, maybe you want to tell us more about your activities in the MENA region and who you are. Sure, thank you, Huda, uh, for the warm uh, introduction and uh, welcome. And uh, thank you, Noura, for uh, inviting me. It's, it's always a pleasure to be uh, here uh, at the World Summit Awards um, uh, events. As a WSA ambassador for Asia, I'm always thrilled um, to exchange views with uh, our uh, community. As a best-run uh, business, having a positive impact on our social environment is, is always a priority for SAP. Uh, we advocate for companies to consider their role in the communities where they work, evolve and develop. And our ultimate goal is to make the world run better and improve people's lives. My name is Batul Husseini. I'm Director of Government Affairs and Corporate Social Responsibility at SAP Middle East and North Africa. Uh, with our signature initiative, Digital Skills for Today, we are on a mission to upskill conflict-affected youth and vulnerable minorities um, with, a, with the uh, skills they need to rebuild their countries and cultivate hope and ambition at every level in their communities. I'm looking forward to this uh, panel discussion with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Batul. And last but not 
East Serania, uh, do, do you want to tell us more about your activities in Egypt and who you are? Thank you. Um, maybe are we uh, confronted to a small technical issue? Uh, Rania, I don't know if you hear us. Uh, we can also continue the presentation uh, later on during the panel. So maybe can sh should we start? So for the audience and everyone that's interested in the digital content industry, uh, we all know that right now in the world we have 350 million Arabs in 22 countries um, and most of them, 90% of them, say that they want to find content uh, online that's in the Arab language. Only 3% do. So could you tell us more about this incredible industry that is thriving? And what is your, I would say, perspective on how it is right now structured in terms of demand and offer? Just to give us an overview of how this industry is structured. Uh, and I'll let you uh, first uh, talk uh, freely here uh, and we will also be taking questions from the audience so please do not hesitate to ask your questions and we will make sure that our panelists can answer. Um, do you want to start Manar or? Uh, I'm happy to start if Manar is still uh Muted, can you? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. All, All right, of course. So the industry is um, multifaceted. It's it's fascinating, complex, and it's constantly uh, evolving. It's it's an ecosystem. So creating digital um, offers breakdown uh, breaking down of barriers and challenges um, and challenging the norms at the same time. Impact is becoming a core value at the center uh, of exchanges uh, of exchanges um, we see the rise of new actors seeking to improve um, the lives of others to have positive impact on their environment and uh, develop their business ethically and durably um, social enterprises circular economy green development tech for good those concepts were all quite silent a uh, few years back and they are now uh, taking the front seat as we drive towards the future. Uh, entrepreneurs uh, particularly um, have been left isolated and this is everywhere. This is not specific to the to the MENA region. They're financially damaged. They're often uh, emotionally strained uh, by the pandemic. Funding streams have dried up. Uh, there is lack of this, this actual lack of physical contact has led to disconnection and loneliness in, um, in, in many um, uh, aspects. This happens just at the time when human connection and collaboration are needed the most and when social issues across all dimensions, um, from gender equity to access to healthcare, have all been uh, impaired. At the same time, um, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, uh, change makers are desperately trying to keep supporting their network and communities, uh, but they are also struggling to adapt. Um, we have outdated formats for online interactions. Um, as a result, I believe the whole sector is experiencing collective pandemic burnout and Zoom fatigue, if you may, Teams fatigue. We're all uh, becoming uh, fatigue of, of being online and, and hearing like, I can't hear you, you're still muted, I have a technical issue. But COVID-19 has been also not only a huge channel uh, challenge, um, but it has also been a catalyst for innovation, cooperation and solidarity. Um, all these young people, entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs have discovered new and better ways uh, to bring about positive change in, into their uh, communities. And um, I believe 2021 has the potential to become the breakthrough year 
for radical collaboration, specifically uh, in the MENA region. This is why I feel um, everybody here from the WSA uh, community and us as corporate social um, uh, change makers and uh, influencers, it's our role to strengthen this sector in the MENA region at an ecosystem level. There's a great potential, there is a great opportunity. Um, we have to continue to do training and connecting organizations um, at a, again, at, a, at an ecosystem level uh, so that we can support uh, all these uh, young change makers, entrepreneurs um, to build and facilitate um, programs for them uh, to unlock their uh, power and the power of their communities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and so basically, uh, we you, you really, I think, highlighted the important dimensions and particularly dimensions related to how people and youth and entrepreneurs are struggling. So maybe if we just try to understand for what reason right now, in the Arab region, we still were not really able to do that leap of faith. What are the main obstacles? I know that there are thousands, but if we had to really cluster them into the most important ones, to your opinion, what are they? What hinders this, uh, this uh, success to really happen? Um, may I? Um, uh, yes, of course. The, the main reason uh, that I that I uh, think people are really having um, difficult times with in the Arab region uh, is the belief of the movers and shakers uh, in this industry when it comes to real content. Uh, I do see lots of uh, decisions taken at a very high level um, related to tech related uh, companies, but only when it makes money from day one. Uh, there are um, uh, lots of, let's say, um, uh, less appreciation for content uh, and for tech solutions uh, that will reward or will be rewarding on the long run. So investors, decision makers would always ask when would I get uh, my uh, break even? Uh, how much cash revenue? What's the cash flow? Uh, so these kinds of questions uh, that drive the decision of decision makers, uh, whether be it uh, private sector or public sector, um, anything that needs persistent and long term um, uh, continuous uh, work and production of content and analyzing uh, the content itself and developing it further uh, is not really appreciated. And this is why we see successful projects um, winning awards uh, on an international stage and then in couple of years maximum, uh, we would see them vanish. And I think that's um, uh, a very, very uh, challenging um, issue that we need to work on changing the mindset of the decision makers. Uh, and that can be done using advocacy, uh, using one to one uh, sessions, um, uh, meeting up with the decision makers, trying to convince them of what's needed uh, to be done. Uh, in addition to investments by decision makers and private sector, I would say also legislations. Uh, content producers do not feel protected when it comes to copyright uh, issues, unfortunately. So that is also another obstacle because content, uh, even if you invest a lot to produce good content, you would still see it being replicated uh, everywhere else and uh, it loses its value, unfortunately, over time. Um, uh, and I would like to end uh, that part uh, with saying uh, also it is unclear what happens with data uh, privacy. So also the engagement and interaction of users who are the clients of those products, um, they do not feel secure enough to share their data uh, with products coming from uh, a region that does not have laws 
to say this is allowed and this is not allowed to be done by the owner or by the uh, solution uh, produ solutions producers, um, uh, not to tamper with the data, not to share the data, etc. Okay. Thank you, Manar. So essentially, investment uh, advocacy with uh, the the governments, the legislation, intellectual property, and um, yeah, creating laws and data privacy. So Rania, you are uh, often working with entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs in Egypt. If you had to uh, probably complete what Manar was saying, do uh, do you think that these are the main obstacles, or are there other elements that you have been uh, confronted to? So, Rania, I think you're still mute. Mm. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone else is uh, hearing Rania. On my side, I'm facing technical issues. This might be a technique, a real... Um, <laughs> well, this is an, uh, I guess, the the obstacle of the year. Oh, is it okay? I'm so sorry, Rania. It's Maybe you remove the. Okay, so maybe until you try again, Rania, and here, Zuhair, uh, I've heard many of your uh, talks online, and I've seen you also discuss about the types of obstacles. You've mentioned the regulation, but are there ever other elements that you would like to highlight? Yes, um, um, I, I think, um, uh, first of all, um, I think that there was a change in terms of the type of content that was uh, delivered in the Arab world. Um, uh, I, at least for Morocco, I think we have a very oral culture and uh, the content that uh, may work is more of voice or video content. So the first, uh, let's say, uh, uh, level of content that was delivered in the Arab world through internet and through dig digital was mainly uh, textual uh, uh, contents. And now we're seeing an increase in terms of content producers uh, but mainly on, on video type or voice type of format through uh, different type of platforms. And I think this is opening a new era in terms of, of content, but at the same time it's creating a lot of problems because the content that we're seeing can range from anything from very interesting content, uh, very uh, instructive and so on, to uh, a very low level or let's say, uh, not really interesting or maybe, maybe even harming type of content. So I think the type of content is very important in the Arab world. Uh, at least in Morocco, as I said, we have an oral culture and uh, most of the content that's working now is voice and video content. So this is something that's interesting. I completely agree with Manar regarding the investments. Um, one of the things I try to do in the last, uh, not only me, but other, other people as well, is really to try to help the startups that, that are working on content uh, in the first two or three years uh, financially and maybe also by opening some doors in order to kind of uh, find some uh, some uh, money from, for example, partnership with the telecom operators or partnership with banks uh, or financial institutions. So these are the type of uh, leverages that we can uh, put in order to help content producers uh, but I think we're still far from uh, from uh, from what we need to do. Uh, it is really surprising because I, uh, I mean, maybe a lot of people know that one of the first success story in the Arab world was uh, a content portal called Maktoub, which was bought by Yahoo for a huge amount at that time. Uh, and it's really surprising that we didn't create any um, other type of startup that are mainly focusing on uh, on contents. And that can be uh, 
a good target for international brands. So I think to go back to what you said, so uh, um, the, the let's say the mindset can be also something that can that can uh, be um, a problem because, as I said, of this our culture, at least for Morocco, uh, the investment also is something that is important. Uh, and uh, when we talk about the regulation, I think before we talk the re regulation, it's also a, a, a question of policy because content is about culture. And uh, if the country don't have a cultural um, uh, a policy uh, with cultural objectives, it's really difficult to find a business model completely uh, working on the content uh, era, uh, area. Thank you. Thank you for these enlightenments, which brings us to basically, would you say that the priorities today would be investment, uh, regulation and mindset, which brings me to you here, Batul, uh, when it comes to skills and uh, preparation of the new generation of youth, because this is what the Arab region is composed of. What's your take on this? How can we try to build something that is sustainable to be on the top of our game? Yeah, um, I think just like any other region in the world, we need our own geniuses. We need Arab coders, Arab developers, Arab content designers, engineers, data specialists. We need mentors, mentors who will be also able to inspire the youth and um, we need to repair the space where innovation can do its magic. We need to foster change from within the communities by teaching kids and youth, training adults on technology, but more importantly, we need to encourage creativity in the region. Innovative solution will come from within. There is currently a huge gap between our needs and the qualification available on the market. Uh, initiatives like Digital Skills for Today, for example, takes a strong stand here um, as we try to act at an early stage. Uh, when we intervene at an early stage with education and professional development, then we are able to have the, um, the Arabic content and we have the Arabic uh, uh, creators who are able to uh, create this content. I would like actually uh, to uh, to add to the uh, to the to the uh, to the hinders and and build on um, all the the uh, great points raised by uh, Manar uh, Zuhair and yourself, Huda. I think the education system in the region is an important factor in transferring the uh, Arabic language online. The education system in the Arab world mainly focuses on reading, writing and speaking in English. Um, and this has generated um, educated people that uses the English language very fluently. Um, we are all native Arabic speakers, but writing in Arabic might be a difficult task for some of us. Education system in the Arab world might not be supporting the advancement in uh, technology that support the Arabic language. Um, and this, uh, the, the higher education in particular in the Arab world supports English language um, where most of the graduates are more comfortable surfing the net, um, but also uh, creating all sorts of content uh, in English instead of, uh, of Arabic. Uh, as a result, we're becoming more and more uh, Arabic speakers um, who are capable of authoring and generating um, more and more of Arabic uh, uh, of content for the internet that is not uh, not very um, Arabic native. Uh, so I think it is necessary to um, encourage also uh, all sort of Arabic scientists to use Arabic language along with the English language to write uh, the research and, and publish uh, all their, uh, you know, content that they create 
that will enrich the Arabic language content um, on the Internet. Yes, so indeed you're mentioning uh, the skills gap, uh, but when you're talking about skills here, not only is are they uh, digital skills, but also linguistic probably skills. Uh, and here the, there is this real question, which is should the Arab countries really just align to the international language, which is the, the language of science in general, probably Chinese tomorrow, or should we really maintain this uh, language, which at the end of the day, if we look at it, it represents half of the European Union talking this Arab language um, in 22 countries. And so indeed, I, I totally agree. There is this real debate about how can we improve the usage of the Arab, Arab lang language. That is probably also related to its level of difficulty to master uh, the, the Arab language. Uh, Rania, I don't know if we can finally hear your voice. Um, would you like... Oh, perfect. This is amazing. <laughs> okay, first I would like to apologize. Uh, today in Egypt the connection is horrible because we're having the biggest thunderstorm since the beginning of the year. So the internet connection is not very stable. I'm doing my best with four connections. So let me introduce myself quickly. I'm Rani Ayman. I'm the founder and the managing director of Entrepreneur. Uh, basically, I work to support uh, local women entrepreneurs and business owners, the young ones who want to start their businesses or they want to grow it up. Uh, we've been operating in Egypt since 2015. And we've been working with thousands of uh, women, uh, not only in uh, Cairo, the main uh, or the capital, but we're working all over Egypt. Um, I definitely agree with everything that you mentioned, especially what Manor mentioned related to the collaboration, because I believe nothing would go better unless we collaborated and work together. Of course, I do agree with every other uh, word was mentioned, uh, as well as the language, uh, yet the collaboration is the key, because uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, I believe supporting organizations like myself and yours, um, our main purpose was to support ourselves as well as, and this is uh, our mandate and this is what why we are here, is to support the other organizations uh, and the small business we are serving. And we find it very, very challenging to do the linkage and the connection because now we have more limited resources and without the collaboration and without working with our partners, we couldn't have made it and we cannot continue. So I believe when the beginning of the pandemic, we, were, we, we shifted and translated uh, all our programs and activities to be uh, online. And this gave us a bigger like uh, mandate to work on now we're working with Levant countries like Tunisia and, and Morocco and Algeria because everyone understands Arabic and this will um, emphasize the point that you were mentioning earlier of the language. Um, because we believe that everyone understands, for example, the, the Egyptian Arabic. We we can understand the other dialects, but the, the Egyptian one is, is very maybe easier because of the media and the, the, the TV and the shows and everything. So I believe now we can collaborate not only with Egyptian organizations, but we can collaborate with the Arab states. I was impressed when I saw that this panel will be Arab speakers, but I wondered why the content is not in Arabic. Why Arabic is speaking in Arabic though all the participants can do? I believe it will take time and I believe we're doing it in English for now because we have a lot of audience who don't uh, or cannot understand English, but um, I believe we should by time start synchronizing the language or synchronizing the terms because when it comes to entrepreneurship, because this is my areas, uh, my area of expertise, um, the, most of the terminologies are in English. So when we localize the terms, it's localized partially Egyptian and partially international um, or, or a, a broad generic thing. If we can make it in, in a, a synchronized language that all the Arabs can understand, this will make it way easier. So this is a challenge, but I believe we're moving forward. We're fixing it and it will take some time, uh, but we're moving on the track. So this is my take on that and I hope the connection was good. Thank you. It was perfect. Don't worry. Um, concerning now, uh, I've been hearing a lot and we often talk about the government and advocacy with the government, but as the private sector and organizations that are now strong enough, what is the role of the private sector and how can we bring the private sector a bit more in this conversation? I know SAP is doing uh, it's it's part of the um, of the efforts, but how can we engage this private sector? How can we get them to sit on this table to do more open innovation and to be 
open to collaborate with these uh, younger initiatives. And probably here, uh, this question is uh, concerns everyone. I'm, I'm, and I'm wondering with you, Zuhair, 20 years of experience starting as a, a small venture and now becoming a big company. Uh, what's the change and how do you see yourself contributing in this ecosystem? Um, and anyone else, of course, is welcome to answer. I think um, uh, if we really want to move forward, the, the private sector needs to, to make what it takes to help. Uh, and uh, from my, my perspective, I think uh, there are two or three things that can be interesting to, to be done. Uh, uh, things that already started like open innovation program. I think a lot of uh, big corporates in different countries in the Arab world are doing these kind of programs to help bring startups and uh, uh, to, towards them to help solve some of their problems. Uh, the second thing I, I, I think which is very important is uh, the monetization of the services or the content. I think that the, the private sector can really help uh, when we're talking about financial institutions, for example, banks and so on, I think they can really have a lot of uh, impacts uh, if they can help with uh, uh, how to monetize the services and how to monetize the, the content. Uh, at least for, for, for Morocco, I think this is something that we really feel uh, important because, um, uh, for example, we have a lot of content, but if we want to monetize it, uh, it's really complicated to go through through banks or through these kind of things. So the, the best thing to do is to do it on, on as I said, said before, on YouTube and so on. The third thing I think which is important, and we try to do it uh, at our level, is uh, that entrepreneurs uh, who succeeded in, in a way uh, in the last years help uh, uh, the, new, the, the young entrepreneurs as uh, business angels uh, and uh, as uh, as mentors and coaches in order to help them um, succeed uh, in, in, uh, in, in, their, uh, in their innovation. So I think these are three levels on which we need to have the private sector completely and fully dedicated to help startups. Because it's not just about uh, innovation or startups, it's also about the, um, the future of our countries. I think the future needs to be built with innovation, with startups with young entrepreneurs uh, and uh, it's also a, a matter of political stability uh, a lot of our countries are facing a kind of demographic transition and uh, this what led to uh, a lot of uh, uh, i mean instability in some countries and i think it's really important that we provide as much as possible the help that's needed by youngs uh, young entrepreneurs uh, in order to help them create new jobs, because my belief is that uh, value will be created through new models based on digital, based on uh, R&D, uh, and based on on this energy that is brought by uh, by these young entrepreneurs and uh, women entrepreneurs that will uh, find new models and create new uh, uh, new ventures. So I think my belief is that this is how we can. Uh, we can succeed. I don't believe that this, the, the governments are, um, I mean, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a problem of, uh, of governments, but I think it's also a problem of altogether changing the mind mindsets, making trust between different companies, different sides of company, uh, creating collaboration uh, possibilities between uh, big corporate, uh, medium corporate and small companies and startups. Uh, these are the key elements. We need to change our mindset as well uh, in the private sector to have more trust, more collaboration, more solidarity in order to succeed in the, the next uh, uh, next years. Thank you. And I'm sure that, Zuhair, you are doing uh, your part uh, in this uh, Moroccan ecosystem of yours. Uh, thank you for this uh, in, in insightful elements. And so here, Rania, maybe you want to add uh, something to this question. Uh, of course, I will agree 100% with Zuhair and I want to add something. I believe it's our role now to start talking to corporates with their language because um, in the past time, I believe we faced a lot of challenges because we tried to communicate with the uh, private sector with our language as organization or supporting organization or NGOs or whatsoever.
whatever the, the supporting name that we're gonna take. But as Zuhair said, we have to talk to them mo money or in a commercial part, because I believe we have to take off the face of the, um, the, the, the social work or the support that we have and we start talking to them what is the what is the benefit out of it for them because by the end of the day they have to see numbers we are value driven and of course a lot of organizations and uh, private sectors are value driven but they have to see what's in it for them from the commercial perspective when we start applying this um in egypt not only entrepreneurial but actually a lot of uh, social enterprises we started to have their support but when uh, we were talking about the values and what we're going to do, it did not sound interesting for them. So I believe we should minimize the communication with each other when it comes to asking for support and start uh, getting the support from the corpus. I believe this is the language or the right language we should uh, start talking on. And of course, um, awareness and advocacy all the way because it will it's growing. And actually in Egypt, we've seen a lot of support when it comes, for example, to uh, sexual harassment or gender in general in the past uh, or actually in the pandemic we've seen how social media have uh, worked when it comes to awareness on that and because of the advocacy and the solidarity that happened on social media the private sector started to inject cash in either for uh, UN agencies or for other organizations in order to support the cause that this happened when they saw what's in it for them so I believe it's the language or how we we, we talk to the other parties is what makes the collaboration actually works better. Thank you, Rana. Yes, indeed. So it is also the responsibility of the other party. Um, and um, and it's interesting to see this perspective of getting some more responsibility as well and not just waiting for the, the private sector to, to come on our side. So when it comes to you here, uh, Batul, I am sure that with all your activities with SAP, you might have uh, your take on this. Yeah, and I would like actually to address immediately uh, the point Rania uh, raised. Rania, I can assure you, uh, and as a person coming from the corporate world, corporates are as keen to speak the language of entrepreneurs as well. We are also thinking, how is it best that we can speak the language that we can, you know, minimize the gap and, and bridge the many gaps uh, that we have. Talking about the government, and um, we we all agree that government uh, governments play an essential role when it comes to bridging uh, all these gaps in in the tech industry, whether by enforcing policies, uh, regulations, um, protecting users, creating the space for innovation to happen, and, and and interacting hand in hand with the many stakeholders, corporations, public actors. We need to reiterate the government commitment for a better um, appropriation of technology. We at SAP understand that public institutions need the support and the flexibility of the private sector, of the companies, of the corporates, especially in light of the um, SDG 17, where partnerships are at the core, are at the center of the sustainable development. Uh, no single government, company or entity can solve the uh, challenge for quality of education, decent work. None of us alone can actually solve any of, of these challenges. By tapping into an extended network, we can all bring our core competencies to the table to accelerate innovation, inclusion, um, sustainable socio-economic uh, change. This is very important. Uh, we have so many different initiatives happening um, at SAP on a global level, uh, on a regional level, and, and a more high local level. Um, one specific um, initiative I would like to, uh, to highlight is our SAP's uh, learning for life uh, initiative. It's our commitment to the Global Youth Alliance uh, through which we support the ambition to impact 6 million young people below the age of 30 to help them uh, build the employability skills um, for the future. Um, and there are so many uh, different initiatives that are happening, as I said, 
Uh, for the MENA region uh, specifically, we work with so many different partners, including in Jazal Arab, RBK, Recoded, um, Tent uh, Partnership uh, for Refugees. Um, I hope I did not forget any of our uh, very important uh, partners. Uh, Changemaker Exchange, this is uh, also a, a great platform that we leverage to uh, to have the multiplier effect. Yeah, so it, these are, I mean, quite impressive uh, activities and we really hope to see more and more uh, of the corporate side doing and engaging in, in the future because today it is it is vital. It is not just uh, something that we have that is uh, nice and nice to have. And so we have talked about the government and uh, and the priorities. We've also mentioned the responsibility to speak both languages at the same time. Uh, but now also, and I think it is important to look at the responsibility of the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur is also an active actor and entrepreneurs are change makers. They are here to solve issues and they also have their part of responsibility. And so here, Manar, can you tell us more based on your experience as an entrepreneur, but also with the community, discussing with the community of entrepreneurs, where do you think are the, I'd say, the priorities for it, that entrepreneurs, what are the responsibilities that they still need to, to take to really make sure that this incredible engine functions? Um, one of the most important things that I still unfortunately see lacking is the part of engagement. So uh, you would see a team of uh, uh, entrepreneurs starting up a, a new company or starting a new project where they keep isolating themselves from um, bringing in new ex expertise to the team. Um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't really um, uh, put lots of stress on young entrepreneurs who lack life skills and social skills to engage others because normally um, um, inventors or innovative people, um, it's not, I wouldn't say majority, but it's common to see them being very protective of their own ideas, of their own products, and that by itself uh, is an obstacle for their product or their project to grow in the future. Uh, so I think mentoring uh, for um, young entrepreneurs um, is very important. Uh, however, if entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs do not welcome it uh, strongly, uh, then they will absolutely lose a huge opportunity to grow and to expand uh, and to even um, uh, grow out of their market to new markets that they have not think of. Uh, the other thing that I'm seeing actually nowadays, uh, given the COVID crisis and the difficulties everyone is going through, um, lots of businesses can no longer survive, small businesses. And it really surprises me that um, each one of them do not want to consider a merger, for example. So they think uh, that no competitor or no other company should uh, be um, brought uh, into their own circle, let's say. Uh, and uh, that eventually will kill the whole project in maximum six months because nobody knows how long this situation uh, will prolong. Nobody knows how it will evolve. Uh, will, will the world be the same uh, in a year time from now? Uh, lots of people are still in denial, especially young entrepreneurs, uh, that um, things will change forever and I keep saying uh, just go and read or watch a small doc, a, a short documentary video about post uh, uh, economy, uh, post World War two or one and see how that has changed the face of the world we know today so that you can make better decisions uh, when it comes to your own project. Uh, so we need 
to definitely uh, work on mentoring uh, and, and giving uh, recommendations and advice. But on the other side, uh, entrepreneurs need to uh, welcome that uh, as well. Uh, diversity is number two that I still see lacking, uh, and I would like to encourage entrepreneurs to really focus on that. Um, they should have a diverse team, uh, gender diversity, uh, age diversity, expertise diversity. It always brings um, 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 added value to, to any uh, development of an idea or um, service or uh, any, any kind of um, uh, uh, a service that they would like to offer their clients. Uh, it helps also in improving the user um, experience when it comes to tech related products. So these are the things that I see lacking when it comes to uh, young, especially young entrepreneurs. On the other hand, when um, when we say the ecosystem, of course, that involves private and pl um, public sector, but um, specifically I would like to address the the private sector. Um, I have seen some cases where um, big corp, corp, uh, corporations would start their own service uh, that is mimicking another service uh, established by young entrepreneurs. And it just breaks my heart because that's just uh, such a wasted opportunity where uh, large corporations could have uh, bought some shares um, instead of offering a full acquisition 100 percent of, of an entrepreneur startup because that's what makes the dialogue um, uh, ending at an early negotiation uh, stage uh, and it never works uh, of course uh, on a short term young entrepreneurs startups cannot survive um, given the cash flow that larger corporations have uh, and so they would be pushed out of the market um, on the short term. On the long term, large corporations cannot keep producing uh, innovative ideas, so cash does not guarantee that, especially with, with um, uh, um, uh, large um, uh, hierarchy and um, authority matrix in large corporations that normally slows down uh, the flow of uh, innovation and development. So I would definitely want to see more of partnership in terms of business partnership rather than acquisition or a takeover from large corporations over startups. Thank you. Thank you for this point. But the reality also, and if we unfortunately look at it, it that there is a slow adoption of uh, fast developing technologies in Arab countries, um, and particularly taking Tunisia to the country to which I belong. And um, and also, I'm, I'm wondering here, how come we are still into a poor quality of the present Arabic websites, portals, I mean, we have incredible skills and talented people that are often going overseas. And so to your opinion, why is it that we are still not able to be at the top of our game? Um, maybe here, uh, Zuhair, uh, question, this question to you. Uh, how do you manage to keep people and how do you manage to ensure the quality of the content that's developed in Morocco? I think it's it's really a big issue because uh, I, I thank you for, for putting this forward because I think the one of the problems that we're, we're facing as uh, as countries but as well as, uh, as, as, as companies is how to uh, really uh, not only uh, keep the skills but really to attract the best skills where, wherever they are. Um, uh, Manar talked about diversity. One of the, the key diversities I think that are really important is also um, uh, international diversity. Uh, it's really important that in the same company we can attract people from, uh, I don't know, from countries, from Africa, from other Arab countries. Uh, and and it's, 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 uh, it's really important to be able to uh, have the right skills in the company in order to improve uh, our solution services and to, to, to innovate. So just to go back to the question, um, I think that uh, this skills battle that is going on, uh, I mean, all around the world is something in which uh, 
we need to, uh, or for which we need to, to think a little bit more. Uh, how, for example, uh, as companies, we can attract the best talents. I think it's not only a matter of, of salaries, it's not a matter of financial conditions, but it's also a matter, a matter of empowerment of the possibility to allow young people to have key position in the company. Uh, uh, it's also a matter of, of, uh, of uh, fiscal laws. Uh, from the state's perspective, it's really important that we have fiscal laws and uh, uh, regulation laws that allow talent to come from all over the world as far as they can contribute to a startup as far as, and this is what have been done by, by a lot of uh, uh, European countries. They created new visas uh, to attract talents and uh, to allow people with the, the let's say, the, 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 the most relevant experiences and the most relevant competencies to come uh, to their countries in a simple way with uh, a process that is as, uh, let's say, as easy as possible and in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in timing that, that can go for, for example, just one week, you can have your, your talent visa and you can go, for example, to, I don't know, to England, to France or to, to Spain. So I think it's really important to be aware of this war, uh, to have our own incentives to talent in uh, both in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, ecosystem, in terms of... Uh, uh, political, uh, social, in, and economic environment, but also in terms of uh, uh, corporate uh, or companies' uh, 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 culture and uh, and and and, uh, and empowerment uh, 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 empowerment policy. So I think this this is really uh, one of the most important things that we need to think about. Um, uh, I go back to what Manar said, uh, which is really important because I think that mentor, mentoring the, the, the startups, mentoring the talents is really important because now it's not about only the knowledge. It's not about uh, uh, knowing the last technologies and uh, being aware of uh, artificial intelligence or uh, blockchain or all these kind of technologies, but it's also about the mindset. And one of the real problem that we have uh, in our uh, environment is is how we um, develop in our uh, uh, talents uh, culture of collaboration, culture of trust, uh, and these are key because again, it's it's not uh, uh, something that will uh, this is something that will help them during the whole their whole uh, professional life. And the problem, for example, when we where we, we work, a startup works with a, a corporate, is generally that the guy from the corporate uh, learned uh, more competition than than collaboration. Uh, uh, I will just uh, uh, take one one uh, uh, so something I took from uh, last year uh, Congress. Uh, uh, there is uh, this thing that this uh, let's say citing that said uh, everyone. Uh, uh, wins when no, when no one loses. Competition over or co collaboration over competition, and we instead of me. If we learn these type of principles, we'll have more collaboration inside the same company, more collaboration between different companies, uh, more collaboration between corporates and startups, and more collaboration between the state or governments and the, the startups. Zuhair, this is this is really great. If I may, uh, Huda, I would like to. Uh, Pick up a couple of um, uh, key points um, brought up by uh, Zuhair, but also by uh, Manar. Empowerment and um, diversity. For me, upskilling communities cannot be achieved without strengthening the bonds that connect individuals. Everybody needs to be included from displaced people to women and children, we cannot imagine developing our region without putting everyone on the same level of empowerment. Everybody needs to be empowered at the same level. We all know what exclusion and discrimination have caused and how they have affected our economic um, development. Fostering economy, um, economic development and community development um, is everybody's responsibility and it's our uh, response to the many challenges that we are facing and 
I have no doubt that we will succeed. It is everyone's responsibility to revive the Arabic civilization, spread hope in the region through innovative and pos uh, positive um, change. Um, young Arabs who make up the largest portion of our uh, population, of our uh, communities, we all need to be very serious about instilling hope among them. We have to invest in them so that they may build uh, globally competitive communities, not on a regional level, but on a global level, be competitive on a, on a global level and build those um, competitive communities on the solid pillars of knowledge and innovation. So thank you for the for for this very i say positive and uh, an incredible uh, message of hope um and i'm also playing here the advocate's devil so my question is now it's been years i'm 41 years old and since i was a kid i hear this incredible uh, arab country merges to create this incredible fourth market why isn't this happening? I mean, think about it. The European Union, with all the differences between the German, the French, the British, the United States, and then Asia, and us here, Arab countries, if, I mean, we are meeting here, I think we've never met before. Uh, we don't necessarily know what's happening, happening in our countries. We barely collaborate. Um, how can we create, and is it possible to think at merging this common market that has or not similar needs and so what's your opinion on this are the needs the same is the culture somehow similar how can we try to build uh, transformative pro program programs or projects that bring together this market and i think that this silence worries me <laughs> may i of course um, uh, well um Having seen different content created over the years, um, there are definitely different needs depending on where uh, the target audience is. So in, in one country um, that has different um, uh, cities would speak different dialects, uh, would have its own uh, needs and its own um, content related uh, that is useful. Uh, yes, there are um, great opportunities to collaborate and to have one uh, project or one solution that fits all. But at the end of the day, we have to also know that we are uh, uh, more beautiful when we have all the different colors of life uh, in one place. So lots of people do not feel comfortable uh, when uh, using the um, uh, Arabic language uh, without, I mean, they prefer using the, the local dialect over uh, the Arabic language, uh, which is okay. Um, I would like to see local content uh, that reflects the needs and the identity of the local people. But overall, there's an overarching space where we can have one uh, platform that serves all. It's just that I think that um, producers are not into that stage yet. Uh, with the internet, uh, with the digital tools, there are no boundaries. It's just that uh, the main issue that I see young entrepreneurs facing when they want to expand their products to fit or to cover the whole region is their worry and concern about the legal issues and the laws governing these regions or these um, countries. So if you do not know how to protect your uh, rights, if you do not know how to um, um, uh, legally manage your conflicts, uh, I always we see that fear uh, that's stopping any kind of an expansion. So they would start looking probably into or considering looking into um, uh, local partnerships or local uh, agents that represents them in other uh, countries. But I think the main thing that would 
uh, offer a blanket that would cover the whole region is the legislations where everyone knows if we conflict, uh, where do we go? If we had an issue, what do we do? Uh, also, since we have mentioned this, uh, I would fear to go uh, and invest or to go and expand a business uh, or a product uh, into a country where I hear lots of um, uh, talks about corruption, because at the end of the day, it seems that I cannot get the things or I cannot protect my rights in that um, geographical uh, space. And that is unfortunately an obstacle. I know a lot of people would think that corruption is related directly to politics and it does not affect uh, people working in IT and entrepreneurs. I completely disagree because that's part of um, any business that you would want to do if you do not feel secured and if you're not confident that you can have uh, a deal that's straightforward. You can have a contract that is, that is straightforward, uh, stating your rights and your liabilities. If that is not guaranteed, people would just, you know, feel that they do not want to step into something that's um, very risky and would rather to stay in, in places where they feel they are in control of their own uh, rights and uh, assets. So it does have a great effect. I know that's not the scope, but I mean, it has to be addressed one way or another. Yeah, intellectual property is clearly an important point, but still uh, looking at uh, usually where do people and youth look at when they aspire to grow? Do they really look very close to the neighborhood uh, or do they usually look to uh, Europe, the US? Um, and so, I don't know, here there is also a real questioning for us uh, Arab countries and neighbors. There is yeah. 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 Sorry, Sahir, would you like to go? No, no, you first. OK, thanks. Um, I'm, I'm reflecting back on um, uh, the, the point you're, you're uh, poising, uh, Huda, and uh, talking about what is still, what is it that we're still not doing uh, right here in the region? And I was thinking, I would like actually to invite every one of us, panelists, attendees, um, um, everybody uh, who's, who's listening to this, to think about your most valuable skill or attribute, what do you think is your superpower? That one ability that is most responsible for your personal or professional uh, success. The quality that in many ways defines who you are, separates you from the crowd, from the herd, signifies your goodness. I think if, if we all take a few seconds and, and think of that one, you know, valuable skill, that attribute is highly marketable, transferable, and I think it's, it's transferable across your life, like from private to professional. It is that one attribute that wins you friends, admiration, respect, it's that something that everyone around you wishes they had. I mean, this could be very much a technical skill. Playing classical guitar, building algorithms, cooking. You're exceptionally a good writer, an athlete, a pilot, or even a carpenter. I think more likely the most valuable asset is not technical. You're exceptionally patient, empathetic. Um, you're a good listener or um, able to resolve conflict and, and build consensus uh, around you in a, in a, in a conversation. Uh, you probably have strong focus or very high stamina. You're incredibly resilient or adaptive. 
manage multiple projects successfully, especially um, female uh, colleagues and, and, and friends. We are all known for being like, you know, able to multitask and, and work on multiple um, projects uh, simultaneously. Or probably having that sixth sense when it comes to risk assessment. A certain level of technical ability or technical competency or a subject matter expertise is often useful uh, and may be required even to have your foot in a door, but it is not necessary. Uh, I think definitely uh, those rare personality attributes that sets you apart from the crowd, those interpersonal skills, communication skills, uh, qualities like patience, uh, adaptability, growth mindset, leadership ability and creativity are the fuel that our region need to innovate and be competitive. These skills are durable, are for life. And as I said, they're very much transferable between all your aspects of life being a wife, a husband, a mother, a father, a mother, um, you know, a working colleague, a leader, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I think this is very important that we unlock the potential of all these superheroes in the region who have those superpowers, um, but they haven't been able to tap into, uh, into these uh, superpowers. And those, those skills, I mean, have you learned patience out of listening to your professor uh, at university? Or, I mean, this is something you learn from life and of course there are it is it is important that we carve out space for these skills to flourish and um, to be unlocked this is uh, really inspiring i wish you would have been a professor at uh, all our arab universities <laughs> thank you <laughs> zuhair yes yeah, I, I I will not have the same uh, eloquent uh, speech, <laughs> but uh, maybe I, I will try just to to have uh, some some level of consistency in what I'm going to say. But uh, I, I I mean I I I think it is uh, uh, it is really important what uh, what Batu said because it's it's really fundamental that we make uh, everyone uh, the better version of, of himself and to make everyone the hero. Uh, of uh, what he is doing, this is really important. Uh, but just to go back to the to the why it succeeded in Europe and not in the Arab world, I think in Europe they had a very pragmatic way of doing it, based mainly on two things: based on economy and based on education and research. And basically, these are two matters where you cannot have conflict or divert that. Uh, uh, you cannot diverge from each other when you are discussing this. In the Arab world, we concentrated more on culture, identity, and so on. So I think if we want to go uh, to, um, I mean, to to uh, to the same level that Europe did, uh, I think it's best to concentrate on things that on which we can completely or totally agree. We can start by having a, a, a free market by trying to have. A, uh, kind of standardized regulation in the different markets. Uh, Anti-corruption is also important. Having kind of uh, transparent market is also important. And try also to concentrate on uh, R&D, uh, innovation uh, and education, because these are things that's, that are very important in the uh, and, and very easy to concentrate on. Uh, I just wanted to, to uh, talk about a story I had with the Rwanda president. I met him some two or three years ago. Uh, and I had the chance to discuss with him for two or three minutes. Um, and uh, I told him, I mean, uh, Mr. President, what is the secret for Rwanda development? And he said three words. He said education, 
anti-corruption and hard working. And uh, I think we need to concentrate on things like this because these are very uh, formal, uh, uh, down to earth and uh, uh, tangible uh, type of objective that we can create as uh, nations, uh, as, uh, as uh, uh, Arabs, and, uh, and this can be also uh, a good way to succeed. Just a final word regarding universities, um, uh, and I, I refer to what Batu says. I think um, w I have an extreme uh, take on, on this topic. I think uh, um, that uh, universities or mass education as it was developed after the first industrial revolution is gone. That we need to concentrate on new form of education. I think knowledge is available everywhere. Uh, education needs to concentrate on coaching people uh, to have the best competencies and to have the best mindset. These are the, the key things. Uh, we can refer to the five C's of the World Economic Forum, which, has, which are creativity, collaboration, communication, complex problem solving and critical thinking. Uh, and we can also refer to growth mindset principles in order to educate our future, um, uh, let's say, talents, mainly on competencies and mindset instead of concentrating on knowledge because I think knowledge uh, is something that will be is already available uh, fully and people can go to Coursera or Udemy or whatever platform they can go to in order to get the knowledge from there. Uh, I think we need to win this, this battle of education because we already lost the battle of media. Uh, and if we want to impact the uh, Arab citizen in all countries, we need to win this battle of education by concentrating, as I said, on competencies and mindset instead of concentrating on knowledge. Well, it seems, um, it seems in reality so simple if you think about it. Education, anti-corruption and hard work, it even goes without saying. I wonder how we made it to arrive to the state where we are right now, which is, of course, plenty of hope. But uh, in the meantime, many mistakes clearly have been committed. Um, I have this question from the audience uh, asking how can solutions born in the West connect with this region and build relationship before launching and vice versa? So basically, Gavin, uh, the question again is how can these solutions coming from the West adapt to our country and build, build relationships? or vice versa. Uh, anyone who wants to give uh, her or his experience on Western-born solutions. Um, if I may, well, uh, if um, I always believe that if that was um, a desire by uh, the owners just to expand and just to be present in um, in uh, in Europe or in America, uh, I don't think that's a good start or that's a good strategy just to say that uh, as a target. However, it should be asked uh, or there's a question that should be asked before deciding uh, to um, tackle a new market to you. Uh, is the need uh, there? Do they have uh, a need for this product? If they do not have the need, then no one would really bother, uh, even if you spent a lot on marketing, even if you have hired the best uh, salespeople, if it does not address a need in my own life. I have enough things that are competing uh, to get my attention to solve in my daily routine. Uh, and I have my priorities as an end user. So if it does not address an issue that I'm facing uh, in my own local uh, um, uh, spot, which is the market that you're trying to go to, then I will not even um, um, be a loyal client. I would try it once, uh, probably, uh, if someone is so curious to try new things, but it would not really uh, be um, uh, feasible uh, on the long run. Um, however, 
I would always encourage market research. Um, so you have to really have some uh, base in that market that you are uh, planning to go to or wishing to go to and do some market research. Is there a need? Uh, how would uh, people accept such a service if it's new? Um, uh, what about the um, uh, purchasing power? Because lots of people go to another market with uh, a an out of range pricing and that is also damaging um, uh, for them. I've seen personally experiences like that. Um, on the other hand, um, there's the same thing when we have products that are coming from um, Europe or uh, America and they think that, OK, let's go to a 20 two or 23 Arab countries in one shot. Actually, that's not the case. The needs in different countries, even in one country, differs from one um, uh, region to another uh, or from one uh, city to another. So just thinking that, OK, I can buy one step uh, add to my um, customer base this much X million uh, users. It's not really uh, the case. This is what uh, doesn't really go um, uh, in reality. So they also have to do the same. Uh, however, I've seen that for lots of cases, especially that we had, uh, let's say, the first in Kuwait as an as an experience that I have lived with and witnessed uh, its growth uh, for international businesses wanting to come into the markets of other countries found that it's much easier and it's much more practical and much more successful if they looked for similar services that are already existing locally and acquire them or uh, go in partnerships with them as um, uh, like in buying shares in those companies and expand, is expanding uh, their uh, geographical uh, presence uh, in the region. Uh, and I've seen th these kinds of successful Manar, stories. Manar, I, I will ask you please to wrap up because the time is over and I wanted to offer a last uh, word to all of our audience. Uh, I hope, Gavin, that Manar has offered uh, insightful comments. Um, and I think that given her experience, I am sure you can trust these recommendations. So um, just before we, uh, I, I thank you all and I'll let you go to your, uh, all of your uh, occupation. Uh, maybe one of you wanted to add something and I wanted to make sure that you have this possibility. Um, okay. One quick last word, I would say it's time uh, for all of us to put inclusion into action. Thank you. Um, and, and more, moreover, I would say that this uh, digital content industry is clearly an incredible opportunity for the countries, even for Arab countries and for all countries in the world, because it's less capitalistic and because it allows for more inclusiveness. Uh, it's all about innovation and there are much less entry barriers. It's really the education and capabilities that we can all build um, and again, and probably this is my last word uh, on, on my side, I think that listening to you, uh, what I've been hearing about the importance of openness, the importance of creativity, of motivation, of collaboration, of diversity, in a word, isn't it freedom? Creating freedom also creates a culture of everything's possible. And I really hope for our Arab uh, countries that the next years are really years where we allow for youth the possibility to speak free, to design free, to innovate, because these are also the basis of innovation. And that is also one important element, I think, that will allow to unlock the potential and to help our youth thrive, to have another positioning in the future uh, using this incredible industry. Thank you so much. It was really an honor to have the possibility to have this conversation with you. I've learned a lot. Um, Zuhair, thank you for being courageous to be the only man among much. these women. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you, Mara. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Huda. Thank you to the panel. Um, I think gender equality, um, specifically in the Arab region, can also mean that we only have one man on the panel. Shukran to everyone.